bhagavato arahato samma samudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samudasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samudasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Holy Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So uh, today, uh, this we start the second day of working with uh, the subjects that uh, we are doing, which is Buddhism as a religion. And we are using the guidance of um, the late uh, Dr. Keshri Damananda Mahatera. Yeah. And um, so the way we did this last time, it seemed to go okay. And so we'll start tonight um, to change my glasses first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that helps a lot. Okay. And then we start with the religious terminology. Now we have so many subjects each time. We have about six or seven little tiny subjects with this. So you should uh, take notes and then ask questions uh, as we go along through this, okay? And last time we talked about the basis of religion and where the Buddhism came in and a little bit about how it was different this time we go into more of the uh, difference with the, uh, the Buddhist setup. And basically, the other religions are going to God and asking him to take care of certain things, like uh, if you do something bad, being forgiven and taking care of the karma issue, okay, which we'll go a little bit explaining here too. Uh, but basically, the difference is, I, when I was a Christian, I used we used to say when we were growing up that the priest in the front of the church, he had the red phone. <laughs> and we would say, he has the red phone to God. And we are the ones that follow step by step. And we ask God to help us and guard us and take care of us. But we also expect that the God had will be taking care of things in life and we don't have to worry about it so much we have to be good and obey the commandments but this you're going to find out is a little different now we go into the religious terminology is the first thing that he talks about and it's very good to listen to this part but in introducing his doctrine the buddha did use the existing religious terms that were current in the time in India, because in this way, he would be on familiar ground with his listeners. And this was important. So they would grasp what he was saying to them, and then he could proceed to develop his original ideas from this common ground. And so what you hear is you hear things like Dharma or Dhamma. The Dhamma is the Pali, the Dharma is the Sanskrit. Or you hear Kama or Karma. You hear Nirvana or Nibbana. And the Muksha is awakening, becoming one uh, with, uh, with God. But this is a little different. And then you hear Niraya, like Niroda, and Samsara, the wheel turning in uh, life, and that's your dependent origination there, and atma, and atta, and we say atta is the, the false belief in an individual self, is how this is working. As are so, These are some of the words that were common in all of the religious groups at the time when he started teaching. But in his teaching, the Buddha gave very rational and unique meanings and interpretations to those things that were existing religious terms already. Now, to me, this sounds very familiar 
with uh, Jesus beginning to teach in the Jewish setup when he came back uh, from his long time away after he uh, was bar mitzvah and you know then he had a number of years he was away when he came back to teach um, he said one time I do not come to change the law I come to fulfill the law it's very interesting that in this case the Buddha is saying I do not disagree with these terms I'm not going to throw them away but I come to interpret for you the deeper meaning and the interpretations of a higher system that goes beyond them. So it's the same sort of thing of fulfilling it where you've been talking about it, but now you're talking about the idea of fulfilling it. The next part is Dharma, uh, the Dharma. Let us take a look at the word Dharma for a minute and uh, the ancient interpretation given to the word uh, Dharma that it's a law that is given by God. But according to the ancient belief, the God promised to appear from time to time to protect his Dharma by taking different incarnations. And the Buddha did not accept that any God uh, could give doctrines and commandments and religious laws. The Buddha used the word Dharma to describe his entire teaching. So the Dharma or Dhamma is the Buddha Dhamma that would be his precise teaching. So when we say Dhamma, we actually don't maybe not mean the Buddha. People were doing this for a long time, but in the last five or six years in the universities in Asia, they give you extra points if you're pointing out Buddha Dhamma. This is interesting. Instead of just saying Dhamma. So Dhamma means that which holds up, upholds and supports the human being. So that's interesting. The Buddha taught the Dhamma to help us escape the suffering that was caused by this existence and to prevent us from this degrading human dignity and descending into the lower states, such as hell or the animal realms, the spirit or the ghost or devil realms. And the Dhamma introduced by the Buddha holds and supports us and frees us from the misery of these realms. So it is also meaning that if we follow the methods that he advocates, we will never get into such unfortunate circumstances as being born in another lifetime where we are blind or crippled or deaf or dumb or mad. And so the Buddha's usage of Dhamma is the advice to support us in our struggle to be free from suffering and also to upgrade human values. And Western philosophers describe the Buddhism as this noble way of life or as a religion that is of freedom and of reason. And you hear more about that as we go on. So I heard the uh, statement uh, in my searching for things this uh, past week where it says about life, you know, pain is inevitable, mental pain, physical pain, and what it causes a difficulty with us. But suffering is optional in the Buddhist teaching. So in this way, you see how things have slipped some out of alignment. When I, like when I told you about the Four Noble Truths, the truths were there is suffering, there is a cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering. There is a path to the cessation of suffering. And then today, now we hear it written a different way, but it doesn't mean the same thing. And it's a slipping away from the original meaning. Now, instead of saying uh, there is suffering, 
we hear a different statement. We hear life is suffering. Now, if that was true, and I just met with four or five young people today, between 18, 25, they understand that's what they think it, it means that all your life is suffering. They are frustrated because they don't know how to talk about uh, the Buddhism when they're talking to other people with other religions because it is confusing right now. Why do the, the other people say, why would you be so stupid to get involved with something that is teaching you life is suffering like that? Now, you know, saying that is okay because the Buddha spent a lot of time explaining what the suffering was very carefully, but he also did something else. And that's the reason people are supposed to be Buddhist. He taught the cessation of the suffering. And this cessation didn't mean all the way to the Nibbana and off the wheel completely to reduce suffering. It meant a journey of a gradual teaching, a gradual practice, and a gradual relief or progress, which was relief from suffering along the way. So as you're learning about uh, a Buddhist teaching, you should be also experiencing gradually an, an immediate, clearly different type of release from suffering that is happening gradually, you should be able to see that happening. That's what makes uh, me very inspired about this teaching. It's the Dhamma is alive and we're showing you how to do that when we're showing you the lesson, the, the practice that we're teaching you. Okay, so the Dharma is not an extraordinary law created or given by anyone. Our body itself is the Dharma. Now, what does that mean when he says this? Our mind itself is the Dharma. The whole universe is the Dharma. But especially in Buddhist teaching, okay, when it says our body is the Dharma, that comes from a discussion between Ananda and the Buddha. And Ananda was with the Buddha one time and he says, Lord, where is the world? What is the world? That's what he asked. The Buddha only said one thing. <clears throat> Ananda, the whole world is from the top of your head to your feet. The whole world, the whole life, the whole Dharma exists between the top of your head and your feet. And as you are being trained, eventually you understand this and you come back to the teacher. Did you know it's all right here from here to your feet? That's where it is and you're right. By understanding the nature of the physical body and the nature of the mind and the worldly conditions, we realize the Dharma. That's what this is about. <coughs> the Buddha taught us to understand the nature of our existence rationally in a realistic way. He was the rational teacher. It concerns the life here and now in each sentient being and thus interrelatedly of all existence. That's what he's teaching. <clears throat> Usually when people talk about religion, they ask, what is your faith? And they use the word faith. And the Buddha was not interested in the development of faith in that way, in an absolute sense, although it can be useful for the preliminary stages of your religious development. The danger is when you start relying on faith alone without analytical knowledge, and that is what can make us into religious fanatics. And those who allow faith 
to crystallize in their minds, cannot see other people's point of view because they're already established in their own minds and uh, what they believe is alone and the truth, and that's it. The Buddha insisted that one must not accept even his own teachings on the basis of faith alone. This is kind of blind faith he is referring to. One must gain knowledge and then develop understanding through study, discussion, meditation, and finally contemplation, reflection and contemplation. A good place to go and find out the path of how to do this is to the Chanki Sutta. Majima Nakaya number 95, which has 12 little steps to work with a teacher properly. And when you follow those steps, you are going to come out with the top of the class in understanding in your practice and everything the teacher is saying. So knowledge is one thing and understanding is another thing. That's, we need to understand that. This is why when the Buddha was teaching, he's teaching knowledge and vision first as a method of learning. You have to see it, he says, before you consider, will I believe this or not? And not just take it upon the word of another person telling you. If there is understanding, one can adjust your life according to changing circumstances based on the knowledge one has. We may have met learned people who know many things, but they're not realistic because of their egoism, their selfishness, their anger, their hatred, and we do not allow them to gain unbiased um, mental attitudes and peace of mind. When it is necessary to compromise, we must know how to compromise. And when it is necessary to tolerate, we must know how to tolerate. When it is necessary to stand firm, we must stand firm with dignity. So he's all talking here about, when he addresses the part about faith, it's okay to come and say, I, I came to this, let me give you an example, with very strong faith and made a commitment, the Buddha must have actually found something. That was my driving force. I believed he must have found something because I met some very remarkable people. And going to find that, I found out the, what he decided to teach was the actual path of learning that he himself had followed. And I learned that knowledge and vision means knowing something by seeing it. Knowledge and wisdom is when you have understood it completely and you have seen it and then you accept it. So when we say <clears throat> with another person, we believe this or believe that, it's not often you find a Buddhist talking that way as much as this is what he said and he decided to teach you and me how to do exactly what he did in order to see clearly what he discovered. So he didn't talk at us, he talked to us about how to do it. Next word is, is the karma or kama. Now, let us take another example of a word, this kama or karma, and it simply means action. If we look and say, how does this begin? The kama is the action. If a person commits a bad action, it will be impossible for the person to escape from its bad effect. Somehow or other, he or she must face the consequences that will follow. According to ancient belief, there is a God to operate the effect of this karma. 
God punishes according to one's bad karma. God rewards according to one's good karma. The Buddha did not accept this belief. He said there is no being or force that handles the operation of the effects of karma, that karma itself will yield the result as a neutral operation of the law of cause and effect. This was a new concept. And he said, we can avoid, and in some cases even overcome the effect of the karma if we act wisely from this point on. He said that we must never, never surrender ourselves fatalistically thinking that once we have done a bad action, there can be no more hope. This had been very oppressing before in some groups. Other religions teach that God can negate an effect of karma through forgiveness. If the followers worship and they pray to the God and make a sacrifice, but the Buddha teaches that we have to affect our own salvation by our own effort and mental purity. So when we look in the beginning of a retreat, you always hear about the, um, the I think it's um, Dueta Vitaka Sutta, Majima Nikaya number 19. And it's a measurement that he, he worked out uh, between uh, living in good thoughts and wholesome thoughts and following precepts versus unwholesome thoughts and unwholesome thoughts and then not living with the precepts. And he figured out that living with the precepts made more sense. I call it the sutta that made legitimized the reason for uh, keeping the precepts in a way because the story and how it worked in that sutta in earnest, you must keep the precepts all the time and not play with them like you only use them for retreats and you don't keep them outside. If you do that, it's like taking two steps forward in the retreat and then one step back and then falling off and then climbing up and falling off and climbing up and then going back to retreat and trying again and again. That doesn't make any progress. The only way is to keep the precepts because the purification of the mind, the retraining of the mind is the setting up for the journey down the path so that it works properly. And then you can be in the right condition to fall into cessation and come out and experience the opening, which is the Nibbana. Now the Buddha can tell you what to do, but he cannot do the work for you. This is the story of the guides. We can tell you how to do it. And if you talking to us and connecting with us, we hear what you say and advise you next step advice on the operation of your meditation. Everything that we do is that way. But you have to do the work of the salvation yourself, which means letting all of the unwholesome uh, mind and thoughts and attachments go. The Buddha has clearly stated that no one can do anything for another for salvation except show the way. And therefore we must not depend on God and not even depend on the Buddha himself. We must know what are the qualities, duties, responsibilities of being a human being. He said, if we have committed certain bad karma, that we should not waste precious energy by being frustrated or disappointed in our efforts to put this right. The very first thing to do is to firmly resolve to stop repeating such bad karma by realizing the harm it can do. The second thing is to cultivate more and more good karma. And thirdly, we must try to reduce evil thoughts, selfishness, hatred, anger, 
jealousy, grudges, and other forms of ill will. And in this way, we can reduce the bad effect of the bad karma that we commit. This is the Buddhist method for overcoming the bad effects. He did not say that we must pray to and worship him, that he would forgive all our sins. You know, and this is very confusing when you go to a temple and uh, your Christian friends or from another religion, they see the person prostrate to the Buddha, but they don't understand the prostration and nobody says a word and they think the person is uh, prostrating to a stone idol and they get confused. But when we lower ourselves before the Buddhist statue, we realize that we are not as pure as the Buddha and we take that position when we go on our knees, we are worshiping meaning in our way, respecting the person who was able to follow the complete path and get through to the super mundane Nibbana. So it's a tribute to the Buddha. And when we put our heads down, if we are doing that kind of prostration where we put our head down to touch the ground, it means that we realize we are emptying out all of the impurities and we are purifying our mind. And we have some uh, way of going down on your knees and then going down with your head down. Sometimes the ties, they lay their arm down like, like this and then they unfold their hands like that. Can you tell what that means? Opening the mind completely in an empty state, in a pure state or still point, becoming completely open is falling into cessation. And then we rise up and do these things three times. The magic number in uh, worshiping in the temple is three. I bet you can understand that Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. The Buddha is the teacher, the master teacher or master meditation teacher. And then the Dhamma is the teaching that he is teaching and putting forth. And then the Sangha who worked for all these 25,000, uh, 2,500 years and attempted to research, practice, preserve, and teach what he taught. Theoretically, that is what this meant. Now, what's gone and happened is the organization of a very spectacular and well put together book that was a commentary that people have embraced. And embracing this was not the problem. In my opinion, it was not the problem. Embracing that and considering it to be as the same as the words of the Buddha. What was the problem was that the suttas themselves, the Nikayas, left the professor's offices and was put back in the library or away from the Buddha studies department in many cases. And then when someone had a question, they always referred to this the problem has been swinging over to creating papers and even theses that are based in bibliographic order of this book, this book, this book, this book again, as a reference point without considering or questioning what they're doing in that paper or treatise or thesis without going back and checking beside the suttas themselves to see whether it matches. And we have drifted away, it has to be, it just has to be that we have drifted away from the original instructions for the meditation. Or if we are on track, we would have lots and lots and lots of Sotapanna, Sakitagamis and Anagamis running around. But because we don't, it seems like we have drifted away from the clear enough understanding of the instructions. Listen carefully. I'm not saying the instructions were not said correctly. I'm saying they've been understood in a different way. And we, instead of pursuing that maybe it should be a little bit this, a little bit that, or retuned a little bit so that it operates correctly, 
we have fallen into a no question zone. So we are caught in the old system of repeating uh, something only for the sake of repeating it, but not necessarily understanding it clearly, but just memorizing it and repeating it so it was preserved. But that's not what the Buddha wanted. He wanted complete questioning and pursuit of the operation of the practice that he was trying to teach. And once it's operating correctly, all of a sudden, it is easy to understand, immediately effective here and now. So interesting, it's inviting deeper inspection and you want to come and see more and more. And all of a sudden, you realize if we did have it correctly, that it would have been untouched by time and it still works. And in our practice, we believe that is true. Next part is purity and impurity. Purity and impurity of our mind depends on ourselves. Neither God, Buddha, nor any human being can pollute or purify your mind. <clears throat> I cannot create impurity in your mind. I cannot purify your mind, but by taking my word or my action, you create either purity or impurity within yourself. And outsiders cannot do anything for your mind if your mind is strong enough to resist it. And that is why knowledge and understanding are so very important. Now the Buddha taught that what man needs for his happiness is not a religion or a mass of theories, but they need an understanding of the cosmic nature of the universe, of its complete operation according to the laws and cause and effect. And until this fact is fully understood, man's understanding of life and his existence will remain imperfect and faulty. The path that the Buddha showed us is, I believe, the only path humanity must tread if it is to escape disaster. And this is something that Nehru said in India. <clears throat> we now talk about uh, Nirvana, Nirvana and Nirvana, same thing, different words. <clears throat> uh, the Buddha never claimed to have created the Dhamma. What he discovered was the universal truth of the real nature of existence. In fact, there are some religious terms were already well known in India at the time. But the Buddha's uniqueness is that he took existing concepts and he gave them very refined meanings and went with much deeper significance. For example, before the Buddha's time, Nibbana simply meant peace or extinction. <clears throat> but he gave it entirely new dimensions of meaning. Ni means no and vana means craving. We say no fire because craving is heat and the heat is the fire of craving. So Bhante usually says no fire. He means no craving. No is the knee. And no selfishness, no more selfishness. <clears throat> You're studying something that is training you in selflessness. Meaning in, in, uh, in Donna terms, generosity, putting someone before yourself, these sort of things, and helping your fellow man and yourself and family. 
we cannot experience Nibbana because we have craving, attachment, and selfishness. These are the blocks. And when we get rid of these defilements, we can experience Nibbanic bliss. It is difficult to experience true bliss because we have emotions that arise and we crave for sensual gratification. So long as we live tangled up in the world of sensual pleasures, we will never experience true happiness. Of course, it is true that we experience some kind of happiness in life, but it cannot be termed as happiness the way we think of it in the absolute sense of the word why because it is not permanent. We cannot gain bliss by harboring anger or hatred, selfishness, or the delusion. Delusion is the false idea of this independent self. It's all about me, 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 me. Occasionally, we do experience certain degrees of emotional satisfaction. This is true, but the nature of this happiness is just like lightning. It is fleeting. It appears for a moment and disappears the next. But true bliss is not like this. If there is true bliss, we will experience a permanent sense of calmness satisfaction and tranquility. So the real purpose of our lives should be to purify our clouded and deluded, misled minds and free ourselves from worries and disturbances. So long as we spend our time constantly solving problems, always looking over our shoulders, always wondering what to do next, we can never be in peace. And this is referring to past, coming up and carried past, past, past experiences, or wondering what to do next is worrying about the future, what will happen next. And great deal today with COVID, we hear a lot of people who are suffering are suffering from what if this happens, what if this happens, what if this happens. So, so much fear and anxiety that they cannot make progress at home or outside of home. And the Buddha's method for this was to develop the mind, which is the next topic. Buddha's advice is that we should be free from these distractions if we want to experience bliss. And this release must be obtained by our own efforts and come from within ourselves. We cannot gain salvation from a God or the Buddha or from heaven. We cannot get ultimate freedom through external agents. Supernatural beings cannot help us to gain the wisdom we seek and final liberation, no matter how much we worship them or praise them through penances, charms, mantras, incantations, and invocations, or animal sacrifices, it doesn't work. We are the results of what we were, and we will be the results of what we are. You can go to 135, even the kind of 135, and this is the uh, Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta, look at that more deeply. Actions condition our happiness or our unhappiness and finally secure our salvation. Salvation or deliverance is an individual affair, just as each human being has to eat and drink and digest and sleep for himself or herself. All of the karmic actions are maintained as part of our mental formations and remain submerged right there. We remain oblivious to these past actions because 
the other mental activities are clouding our mind and therefore cannot recall actions in the past. When we deliver our minds through meditation, we arrest the distractions provided by the five senses. We let them go. We pay no attention to them. We stop feeding them our personal attention. And they diminish, 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 and move away, fade out. We talk about sitting in parts of the fourth jhana, meaning four, five, six, seven uh, in the jhanas. And as you're practicing, if you go an hour and a half or so we were sitting for two hours in a group once and a cat got onto the top of a trash can, a metal trash can. And he got the lid flipped off onto the stone floor. No one moved, no one jumped. Everyone was absolutely still and kept practicing. After we came out, we had discussions about what happened with the sound. We all knew that we heard the sound, but what happened was an experience of pretty good, strong equanimity. And so someone might have seen it in the dark, go across in front of them as a wave of sound. Someone else might have seen a shot of pink light across. Someone else might have uh, seen it in another way a pattern come and go very quickly when it happened. But the sound itself, we all agreed, was as if we were sitting inside a cave and this happened up there above us, out by the entrance to the cave, far away. And yet the sound was very loud, but it wasn't, it was diminished by our watching very carefully inside. And when the mind is clear, it reduces anxiety. It reduces craving, reduces anger, reduces jealousy and delusion falls away. That's the understanding everything is happening is me, is part of me, that's the delusion. The mind that is clear becomes energetic and alert. Does this sound familiar in your practice? And this is when we can influence the mental activities and release enormous latent powers from within. This is psychic power. It is present in all of us. We only have to learn to release it through meditation. Another way of reaching the deposited mental activities is by hypnotism. Through hypnotism, some people have developed a degree of psychic power, but it is not recommended because hypnotism depends on another agent and does not affect purification of one's mind. That's because the purification the Buddha was teaching had to happen through the person's own internal experience happening. And when you're dealing with hypnosis, there is a guiding voice coming in. So you're not totally freeing mind to empty out in the natural way on its own. The Buddha, he advised his followers to cultivate and develop the latent power within them. He showed them how to make the best use of their willpower and intelligence without being slaves to any unknown being to find internal happiness. Without blaming anybody else, Buddhism teaches the man is responsible for his own action. The man should face the facts of life and shoulder the responsibilities of his life by fulfilling his duties and his obligations to himself as well as to others. His pain and pleasure are created by himself 
and he has the ability to get rid of his sufferings and maintain peace and happiness by understanding his weaknesses and using his own effort to overcome them. And this should sound familiar to you if you're practicing twim, because this is the schematic for twim. This is showing you how you to purify and retrain your mind. And your mind is learning a cooperative communication with you to lean in a direction. Remember the phrase, what you think and ponder on? That becomes the inclination of your mind. And this is how this is working. Man's untrained mind is responsible for all the troubles, calamities, disturbances, unfavorable circumstances, and even the changes of the elements and matter. Conversely, man's mind can change unfortunate situations in the world and also can make it a peaceful, prosperous, and happy place for all to live. But this can be done only through the purification of mental energy first. Why? Why? Because mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind made are they. And they all start from mind and flow into body and outward into actions. And that's how everything changes. So the Buddha actually made a decision from all that he knew and all he learned and experienced himself to reach his own opening. And he looked at it and decided to embrace a higher teaching, that one that is effective immediately here and now. The Buddha's method or technique of teaching was different from that of the others. He never gave prepared public talks or lectures. He always decided on a topic that was based on immediate incident and observation. This is one of his methods of his sutta design. One of the marks of the Buddha's genius and his skill as a teacher was his well-tried pedagogical practice of pro proceeding from the known to the unknown. Look at your suttas when you're reading them. Stop a moment or read one and hear Bhante talk, but then go back to the sutta and catch the framework. It's remarkable. By going from the known to the unknown. For example, on one occasion, and this is a good example, this one he chose. <clears throat> on one occasion, he and his followers were walking along a riverbank and the Buddha noticed a piece of wood that was floating downstream. He stopped and he asked the question, what do you think of that piece of wood? What will happen to it? And one disciple answered, it may land on an island in the middle of the river. But others said it may get saturated with water and it might sink. Or people will take it and cut it up for firewood. And it will complete its journey all the way to the sea. Now, who is correct? Who can accurately predict the fate of this piece of wood in the river? The Buddha then explained that our life is just like a piece of wood floating downstream. It is full, we are full of uncertainty. No one can say what will happen to us the next day or the next month. His method was to take lessons from everyday life so that his teachings were always rooted in the here and now and totally relevant to human experience. In this way, he gave due credit to human beings to think freely by using their own common sense. He did not introduce a religion to be practiced slavishly out of fear and craving for any worldly gain. According to the Buddha, a beautiful thought and word which is not followed 
by corresponding action is just like a bright flower that has no scent and is going to bear no fruit. The Eightfold Path introduced by the Buddha is a planned course of inward culture and progress. By merely resorting to external worship, ceremonies and prayers, no one can ever make progress in righteousness and inner development. For mere prayer for salvation, the Buddha says, is like asking the farther bank of the river to come over so that one may get to the other side without any personal effort in the boat. I love these, I think they're wonderful. Self-discovery. Many religions claim that messages were revealed to mankind by a God. However, some rationalists ask if there is only one God and he has given his message for the benefit of all mankind, why are there so many different beliefs in the world? And if the message was meant for the whole of the human race, what was the difficulty for the God to announce his message publicly so that there would be no room for doubt or misinterpretation. Everybody would accept the message and there would be no religious friction and the whole world could just follow the one message of the one God. Many years ago, there was a religious seminar in the University of Malaysia and there, there were five speakers and one of each religion. And after they talked, one student asked a question. When we study our religion, we get some information about this wor world and the universe and life. When we study science, we get entirely different information. And this information contradicts our religious concepts. So I do not know what to accept the teaching of my religion or the teaching of science? This was the question. One of the speakers replied, well, I believe that God gave his doctrines in the form of a message to one man who then spread it to the others. So we must follow and believe the word of God. But the student persisted. How do you know? that the people to whom this message was conveyed understood it correctly? That is the question, isn't it? Could it not have been distorted and misinterpreted in their minds and then passed on to posterity? The Buddha, on the other hand, never claimed anything like receiving knowledge from outside sources. Throughout his ministry, he always asserted that his listeners were free to question him and challenge his teachings so they could personally realize the truth. He said, come and see. He did not say, come and believe. He said, come and see for yourself. Whenever he spoke anything, it was because he had personally tested the validity of the saying for himself as an ordinary human being. He claimed no divinity. He understood everything because he knew how he had suffered during so many previous births for all the bad deeds he had committed through ignorance. And he had learned the hard way he advised his followers through his own experience. He had done tremendous service to mankind by practicing and observing the perfections one by one, the paramis over countless light times, and finally experienced the supreme bliss of the super mundane Nibbana. We have to ask ourselves, which is more reliable the testimony of the one 
who speaks from personal experience or that of one who claims to have heard it from someone else who is always invisible. This was the frustration that happens. So this is what he was saying in the lecture this far. And I had to uh, add one thing. Uh, I have to see if I, I don't know if I left this open, but let me just look for you and see. I, I think, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I did. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, I can do it from here. Okay. Okay. So these two pieces, um, I don't know if I can, well, I'll, I'll just leave this on. It's on now so I can go back to you. Back to you. And then I can go to, I need a little bit of guidance here, mm -hmm. to share screen and find the document. Here you go. I just want to look here. <clears throat> you can open it or not. I'm not sure how to open it. There we go. So <clears throat> what I added in this week, because of the points that we have covered is one of the things that Bhante Vimala Ramsey has done is that he has resurrected the four steps of right effort, which for some reason, and it's not really worth the time to go back and try to trace it as much as some of us get curious about it, it's impossible to do to go back and figure out exactly what happened. But for some reason, right effort got lost. And when you listened to what he was talking about in the way uh, that he was explaining it, okay, uh, the steps in right effort was a key piece in the Eightfold Path that had to sit with the three pieces at the bottom, the right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, or the harmonious practice and the harmonious observation and harmonious, the right harmonious collectedness of mind. When these three pieces slip away from the original definitions, all progress stops down the path. So when we say, what did Bhante Vimala Ramsey really accomplish? What did he do? He looked at this very same way I looked at this, that this whole entire adventure is about the Buddha who taught based on his own experience, how did the practice he used, how did he use the Four Noble Truths? He, in the suttas, if you go and examine how he wrote the suttas, he wrote it from experiences as they were walking around. That's true. That's true. The tree, you know, the heartwood, uh, and um, the understanding that the key piece to make craving operate was to get caught in atta. And if I have this opinion operating, this personal opinion operating all the time that goes after the craving. And all those verbs, they, they I hate, I, um, I, um, I fear, I hate, I uh, love all these things, but none of the verbs actually work without I pushing it behind it. They're all just words. They don't mean a thing if there isn't something pushing them. So no verb in a language, especially English, but all of them I have investigated, no verb can operate without a pronoun. That's interesting. So if we remove the pronoun and we say anata, anata, 
I'm not there, then this falls away and something comes up in place of it. So there must have been a practice out there that was replacing ill will and uh, cruelty and discontent and aversion. There must have been some kind of practice he had going that was doing that. We have this practice, don't we? Yes. Because we are doing Brahma Viharas, that is the point of the Brahma Viharas. So the Brahma Viharas, they don't, an interesting thing is people will say Brahma Viharas, they will not take you all the way to Nibbana. Well, it's a funny question, isn't it? Because it'll take you all the way to nothingness. Yeah. And then going through neither perception or non perception, you are in exactly the same frame of object as the breathing meditator is no longer watching breath that goes away. And then he's looking just at mind until he flips, he falls over into cessation. Well, but the benefit, the added benefit of using the Brahma Viharas is the effect it has on the entire world and how it can change us because of this other point that I, I was, um, this other point here that I was uh, showing you, I wanted to point out, we are suffering uh, and man is in trouble and the Buddha comes and he is trying to change the direction from a war mentality. The mentality is full of ill will, full of hatred, full of cruelty and full of discontent and full of in it's no no in, uh, no equanimous states everybody is upset upset and very rough he's trying to smooth it all out so how did he do it this is where uh, you want to see what the Buddha did in your search as you're going along, discover what he did. How did he do it? Huh? And the question is, what was his end result? Loving kindness, forgiveness, compassion. Yes. Yes. And the loving kindness, the compassion, the joy, the equanimity was canceling systematically in a natural way. According to nature, the brain can only do one thing at a time. If you are practicing loving kindness, you cannot have thinking about ill will. If you are practicing compassion, you are not thinking anymore about cruelty. If you are working with joy, this internal joy and the um, enlightenment factors of joy are beginning to flow through you and come into balance with the seven other factors of awakening, you don't have any discontent with that kind of joy inside you. You do not have any discontent. You laugh at the flood when the rain comes in and when the mud happens, you clean it up and start again. And you know, this is rolling with the punches. And this is a give and take. This is an understanding about the impermanence. When the water doesn't come, you go and get the buckets and you go and take it to use, do, to get the water from the river, you carry it back. You do what's necessary and you adjust to what, how you are living. This is how it all works. This is how it all works. And the equanimity, what happens there? There's no more aversion. You need someone to do the dirtiest job in the whole neighborhood and nobody will do it. Okay, fine, we'll do it. My crew will do it because we have a secret. We know the beginning, the middle and the end of that job. And we'll just do it. And it will be in the middle and it'll be to the end. We know there's an end because of a Nietzsche. So this is a relief to understand the anicca, to understand the suffering is inflicted, self-inflicted. So this is where in the very beginning, I told you this one phrase is a very excellent phrase to remember. In life, pain is inevitable, but suffering, 
suffering is optional. If you understand the Buddhist teaching, you are learning it to use a practice that is very much everything we just discussed in here. When I send you the copy of this, you see for yourself, everything that's in there is right in line with what you're practicing with those four steps of right effort. Those four steps of right effort are very curious because down through the ages, four steps of right effort were mentioned and carried through on charts all over the place in each Buddhist country, in Thailand, in Burma, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, it's just everywhere. They have this list, they have four steps of right effort. But I challenge you, go and start asking the monks the question, sir, could you please tell me what is right effort? From the Eightfold Path, what is right effort? Too many times we hear it's work hard, persevere, put the shoulder to the wheel, push as hard as you can. <laughs> yes, that's the wrong definition for Buddhist right effort. And the professor in Sri Lanka said, as I left, can't you stay for five years and build a dictionary that is an English dictionary just for the function of the teaching, that's what we really need, but nobody will take the time to catch all those different words that have slipped away from what the Buddhist meaning for those words was. This is the catch, this is the problem. So by losing those four steps and turning it into a simple definition in the beginning of the word effort in the dictionary, but you didn't look all the way through. This is true if you go and look at delusion too. Delusion is another word, I think it was like that. Delusion, we can do a lot with the sources to find words that are like, like uh, what we're hunting for, but occasionally we come to, I think delusion was, let me see, delusion was one of them where uh, the actual, what we needed was there, but it was buried. Then the question came up for me. Yeah, here it is, here it is. Uh, you know, the question came up here for me. How many times when you're studying a language that is not your own, but even in your own language, okay? Well, you go to the dictionary to find out the definition of a word and you see the little numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, but you're in a hurry and you're going to get to class and you wanna make sure you know that word. So when you look up delusion, it says false impression and you just leave and that's what you think it means. But that has nothing to do with the delusion that is being taught in, in um, in Buddhism. So here we have delusion and I'm looking at uh, a thesaurus and that means I'm hunting for synonyms, words that mean the same thing as delusion. And it says false impression, false belief. Well, that was sort of in there in line. Another one, misconception, misapprehension, misunderstanding, misbelief, mistake, and way down at the bottom, it says deception, error, fallacy, illusion, fancy, phantasm, fool's paradise. It says self-deception. How about that? One for the thesaurus, self-deception. That was it. The false idea of a self is Buddhist delusion. But these other words, they would chase you all over the map. If you took these words and went to the Buddhist teacher thinking you knew what delusion was and he's talking about it in his uh, text to you and you wouldn't, you wouldn't catch what it meant um, at all. That's just one example. There's, and the effort, I'm not sure what we found about effort in this booklet, in this thesaurus, but let's, we can try effort um, because uh, we never can get the accurate one that tells us a little, even a little piece of what it is. Here you go. <laughs> now you can understand how did effort get lost in Buddhism? Ready? The uh, words are exertion, force, power, 
energy, work, muscle, application, labor, striving, endeavor, toil, struggling, strain, stress, travail, attempt to try to endeavor, achievement, accomplishment, attainment, result, creation, production, feat, and deed. Sounds like an awful lot of hard work, awful lot of hard work. And here were the four steps of right effort, the whole basis of your practice in tranquil wisdom inside meditation with two components sitting in it. Let's get out of here for just a minute. Um, I go in again and show you one more time so you can see it plain as day. And here, where is four steps of right effort and the four steps, one, two, three, four. It's the whole story. And I always draw this line, don't I? And you'll see why in a minute, okay? The first one was to recognize the unwholesome mind state. Second was to release, let it go. Release unwholesome unwholesome mind state, let me say state, and we added this one and relax. And I'll tell you why we added it in a second. The third one was to bring up a wholesome mind state. And the fourth one was to continue wholesome mind states. Okay. And create new wholesome mind states because now you know what it feels like to have a wholesome mind state. So that's it. Recognize, release, relax. The fastest way you can bring up a wholesome mind state is to smile. And then we found out scientifically that something is going on in your brain that's very important. And that's why this is so important to smile, 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 smile the entire time that you're practicing. And it has to do with the two lobes of your brain and relaxing those two. It's not enough to just let go and relax your head. But then when you smile, you uplift yourself. Anytime you're mad with somebody, if you have a buddy or a mate that you're living with or partner, uh, the moment you guys get in an argument, you can say, ah, oh, you're craving, I'm craving. You start laughing, it's all over. There's no more anger, it's all gone. Doesn't matter what it was. It's just all gone immediately. You just canceled it out. Brain can only do one thing at a time. As an intelligent be being, I, 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 I just encourage you to keep laughing. Keep laughing at life, you know? And then continue with a wholesome mind state. And how you do this is because now you know because you did this here and you let go and relax, then you brought up this wholesome mind state. You know what this feels like. And when we're developing this, you know, and trying to pin it down why it's working. We're, Bunty is curious of that. And it's this, we think the same way. You know, these are the same questions I came. If he found something, uh, the Buddha found something that can help with suffering, I want a piece of it. I want to know because of what had happened in my life. I wanted it. And I wanted to see what it was and how it worked. And then forever I'm sold because it was real. It was not phony. It was real. And now I want you to see it. And when we teach you, when we guide you, whatever we're telling you, even if it sounds harsh sometimes, like you come and say, I don't feel like smiling. And we say, I don't care, <laughs> smile anyway. <laughs> and you're, you're very resentful and you think, my goodness, you know, my goodness, what's she saying? I have to smile, I don't feel like smiling. 
because it's not about feeling about smiling. It's not, it's actually pinching this muscle and this muscle with this little smile, making, feeling it in your cheeks, doing that. And by doing that, you're keeping your mind open. You're keeping yourself up and it's sharp and awareness and alert without doing it. When the, these go down, when your, your smile goes down instead of up and you're not pinching these, your, your lower level of mindfulness and observation and attention and concentration fall out of whack. And so by keeping it up, that's how you keep it going. And that's how you feel lighter. So we had to pin down one thing I said, you know, when you're teaching, we've got to be able to tell them exactly what is this. And what is this? What is unwholesome? What is wholesome? And we pinned it down to simple, the unwholesome. It has the tension and the tightness. And the wholesome, no tension. The more wholesome, the less tension, no tension, tightness. Okay. And the as you reduce the tension and tightness, then you're reducing the uh, wholesome. You're letting your uh, you're reducing the unwholesome by reducing the tension and tightness. That's why this whole thing works. So this is a cleaning system. It is a, a cycle that is bringing about two important things that were mentioned in the lecture when I was reading it to you, and it is the purifying purifying is here in this part and the retraining retrain mind that is in this part bring up the wholesome and to replace it so what is this telling you this is very exciting this is telling you that if you do one and two and you don't do three and four you don't make any progress and nothing will stick and your brain won't change that's what it's telling you but if you do one, two, three, four, then everything starts to change the neural pathways in your brain with the new science, with neuroplasticity, it changes. And the more times you do that again and again, let it go, relax, bring up the smile, keep going and build more wholesome things, the more you are changing your mind. When you're changing your mind, you're changing the world. So you wanted to change the world. So you wanted it to shift from war mentality to peace mentality. You keep practicing. But how can I affect the world? I'm just one person, but you have an energy around you. And this is nature. All these religions and most of the ones in India have this sense of this, this power and this aura around you. This is your energy line. This is your vibration. And when something vibrates, it sends out light. And that light vibration touches other people. So what do you mean? I mean that if I go to a center and everyone is having an argument in there and there's 50 people in there, if I walk in, send in loving kindness into there and keep smiling through and the whole thing that people start calming down. What happened? How? I'm not magic. Nobody's, we're not magic. We changed the, the vibration. You can change the vibration. You can do it with a dog, with a horse, with a cow. You can do it with people. You can do it with the soldiers. That's what happened in Burma when she went right up and said, we are here in loving kindness and peace and moved his gun out of the way and walked past. You have to understand you are not helpless. You have to understand the power and the light that's inside you. You have to reclaim what the Buddha was finding and what he was attempting to teach you, but he can't do it for you. He can't give it to you in a box. Here, here it is, no. He can't do it. You have to see it. So he set up a way to teach. And I've told you many times, 
his way is not to talk about knowledge and wisdom, but knowledge and vision first and personally confirm what you see and test how it works. Then it turns into knowledge and wisdom. And you wanna share it with somebody who's having a rough time in a big mall when there's a whole, uh, everybody has to evacuate suddenly and the person's terrified. And you know what? Your energy can change the whole situation. It can change the situation and find a way to help you and those around you. You can, you just don't know it yet. It's inside you and it's part of you. It's always been part of you. So I'm gonna throw this open to questions now because we are at this point where we're almost uh, just, we did pretty well here actually. We can throw it open now to questions and in any part of this that you have questions, pop a question, see what happens here, okay? Anyone have a question? Hi, Sarah. Hello, it was such a really good um, session. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I have got a couple of questions, but the first one is, um, what did I write down? Yes, it's to do with what you said about hypnotism. And I remember that was something that um, I think I wanted to ask you or possibly asked you in a email. Um, because I, I know someone who started to do some work with us and has gone on to do a hypnosis training. And you have described here, and so she and she has enormously good feedback that I've heard on social media. It's mm -hmm. like everyone is altering from uh, from what she's doing. And you said here that um, it's not recommended because you're using an agent, but it can have an impact in freeing the mind. Yes. This so, matter, you know, I, I'm curious I was... about how it. Yeah. what it does and say so, so I, I've never done it so I don't have an, any experience of the impact of this but how where would you be left if you've done some hypnosis and you've had some what feels like personality change and had some relief from all these difficult habits and reflexes what 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 happens to you in 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 terms of the purification hasn't been a it hasn't been totally under your own effort or at all under your own effort. You see how the four steps of right effort are set up mm -hmm. and how your practice operates in the two parts. One is purification and one is retraining the mind, literally retraining the mind through, through repetition, repetition, repetition. So. I, hypnotism isn't all bad. He didn't say that. And it wasn't me, actually. That was from his, uh, his talk. Oh, yeah. And it was, he was pointing out that just the way God or uh, gods in, within any religion are, are expected to do something for you. It's step, he doesn't, uh, the Buddha didn't want you to step away. He wanted you to take personal responsibility. You see, the one thing that was so great um was this independence and personal responsibility which the which happened through dr ambikar for the people one of the reasons it was good for them was to bring be confronted with the idea of total personal responsibility nobody is going to do it for you this is something we have to face in this world we have psychological setups in many uh, developed countries that have just sat there and accepted we'll just let these people come and say they're victims and will and so I'm so sorry for you and I'll let's have some drugs to make you feel better and and you know this kind of thing and they'll they'll support that and it will get worse and worse the victim thing so the point is that with the mechanism of if with hypnosis there is no denying there's a voice there that is is coaching you now you can work with a person and the person can be very good at um at, you need a very good person okay who 
takes the time to figure out what needs to happen for you. And then that's a guide. The guide is going to do it for you, be the guiding person, okay? The problem here is now the good part, let's do the good part first. It doesn't tell you that you're a chicken and make you walk out going rah, 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 down the street. Okay, that was good of them. I'm kidding, of course, okay. But what I'm saying is he gave you directives to let go of the fear and be bold and go ahead and live life in a strong way, in a confident way. And you, you resonate with that and you have this put in, you couldn't have it put in by your parents. You were too afraid and anxiety ridden by what was happening in the house or something like that. And they put this in and they support it for you. And then you come out and then you go from there and you see what happens. Now, sometimes it can be terrific and very good. And sometimes it needs to be re-supported, re-supported, uh, to a certain point until the person gets a new habitual tendency. The principle is the same and it can work very well. But he's saying you don't go, what he was talking about was you don't go for a spiritual line of development in your life, trusting on a hypnosis line of, of, of as a modality to solve it for you. He's saying the natural way, going back to nature, how was the human being designed and the human design of the human being was that they can do this for themselves, but they must have the steps given by a guide to help you to not only purify. You know, many, many people work very, very hard in many, many teachers to purify, 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 purify but they don't retrain the brain. And when they leave the retreat, it all falls away. And it's like you're leaving the retreat and going back to, uh, if you go back to Washington DC after the retreat, we used to say, you're going back into the belly of the beast. But you, in a matter of time, actually, and they believe that too in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, some of the people there feel that way because they go to retreat four times a year and to come back and fall down and have to go to retreat. So they are uh, in this, this way, progressing here, 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 again and again. It's not a bad life, but it's not the whole story. It's not the whole tamale. So, you know, you want the whole tamale is the term. The Italians say, I want the tamale. <laughs> you know, I want the whole deal. When I came to it, I want to know, can I really change? Because the whole world said after what's happened in the family and all the deaths and everything that occurred and the leavings and the, all the, everything that has happened, you cannot. And I didn't believe it. I was just going to defy it but I didn't know how. And then I bumped into Bhante. <laughs> Rest is history. Would you, would you say then that the, the aspect that is missing, what I'm hearing, the aspect that's missing is the wisdom won't develop. There may be some retraining okay. by an agency, well, but we don't- Try this again. The knowledge and vision is skipped and you're trying to get the knowledge and wisdom. That makes sense. The Buddha had these two steps, knowledge and vision for the purpose of personal experience and direct knowledge is different. And the direct knowledge comes from actually seeing it. And then you can believe it when it changes your life and it changes everything. Then you can believe it. Yeah. Okay. You get kind of, you get some kind of fix then but you don't get the, um, you don't actually get to see the path. You haven't done it alone. That's the first one that can kick back on you. And a person can feel without that, that crutch of that other person guiding, it's not complete. You have to have a lot of faith. And I know someone who's very good and known very well in the world, and she's in Indonesia. She's marvelous and has solved many people's, helped many, many people in many, many ways, okay? And if you have a, can put your faith in that, and you can, you know that eventually you'll be free and independent, because eventually it will change if, of course, if you're doing the wholesome, that's the directive, to give up these negative things, to identify the symptoms. How about if I put you in a hypnosis and I told you, let's identify the symptoms for unwholesome states of mind that pull you down. 
And we talk about that in the, during this session and you begin to see, identify from recalling in situations over the years that these were unwholesome states and I didn't know what they were and they pulled me down. Now you need wholesome states and you discover wholesome states are going to carry you up. Take the Sutta 19 and apply it to the idea of hypnotism. If the voice, the person's there to guide you always to replacing it and repeatedly doing it to, re to what is happening if I keep doing this. Pretty soon, I'm not gonna be able to walk without somebody hitting me on the head. <laughs> No, but I'm, the, the same thing again and again is changing the brain. We know this now scientifically. We don't have to tell you from Buddhism anymore because neuroplasticity is a proven point, the flexibility of the brain and the ability to change the neural pathways, which are for the individual behavior patterns out here. We can change them and the old ones fall away. Yeah. This, is, this brings really neatly onto my next question. Okay. which is to do with the withering of neural pathways and um, attainments because just I'm, I'm curious about um, just if you if you go with the idea of neural plasticity and withering neural pathways of the 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 reflexes and habits that are unwholesome and then you move and progress and attain along the path if you stopped in some way, why, why wouldn't the, the healthy neural pathways wither and you drop down? What, what, what do you feel is going on about the stability that means those neural pathways wouldn't re-wither? Of course they'll wither if you don't use them. That's the whole system they're trying to identify. Before, Sarah, they thought it was a static pattern. I could take a picture of your brain and they actually believed that if they took the picture again, six months or 10 months away, it would all look exactly the same. This picture, this, this weave, whatever it is, you know, would look all the same if we drew it, okay? And they didn't have any way of watching this. You know, there, nobody knew they were wrong because they had no way of actually watching it. And then the new MRI cameras came. And when those MRI cameras came and were developed in the next generation, that's when all of this research started. It's like 12, 15 years back, okay? And that started. And then it started pouring out in the last five years. It started pouring out into the mainstream. So everybody began to get a, a, a finally see a picture of it after the rule in research is 10 years, 10 year block. I have something to say to humanity. <laughs> but without a 10 year block of research, I can't say anything to humanity. That's sort of the way that research uh, quadrant of human beings is set up. So nobody wants to believe it's real unless you have 10 year block with it. Okay, there's many examples of that. So what are the um, descriptions, and I know you've, you've talked about them before about path mm -hmm. and fruit. So if, if you've actually, I, and the way I've understood that is the, the fruit is the fruition and the, the stabilizing of of the mind so that there are um yeah maybe some more permanent withering of, of systems but do you, so so just just to be completely clear what if you um what if there's an anagami uh with fruit and right. then and then kind of practice drops off attention drops off awareness is She's okay. She's you know. would the withering would the withering of neural pathways happen? Well, and there'd be a first of all, if she actually was an anagami, she's not gonna slip. It's not gonna happen. That's part of your test of the verification of an anagami. It's just not ever gonna slip, you know? And then the 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 actual attainments. They, we, the way it's designed in the text, it can fall away if it's not sealed, locked in place. That's the sealing or the fruition. Fruition it means- There's something different happen there around the plasticity of the mind. It's That's still, what's it's interesting. Still, it's kind of silly to try and do the demonstration you're trying to do on an anagami. It's just kind of silly because it's, the likelihood of it happening just, no, <laughs> it's not gonna happen because they're not they're at a point where they're not gonna break precepts at all anymore. It's gone, that's gone. They're paramis, 
are pretty well sealed. The only thing that's kind of left for them is uh, the craving and the clinging. Uh, craving a little bit, of, the craving has not gone away and that gets off finally at the end that goes with Arahat, okay? But now see, even the, the um, and you have to look at this, the reality of it's all a hypothetical system, of course, it's a hypothetical system because they, <laughs> you know, because if you're looking out where, however, when you're in it and you're working on the levels, you begin to realize how these things work. I give you one interesting thing that you should take into consideration. A friend of mine, you know, went as far as um, what, uh, uh, Sotapanna and um, had uh, Sotapanna and fruition, okay? And then the person dropped out and wasn't practicing for six or seven months at all. And then when they came back, what the person noticed, the student noticed that was really interesting was when they came back, they were much deeper than when they quit up here. They were much deeper, easier for them to get down here. Now there's two things going on. There's two things going on there. As a teacher, you, I can talk to you about how there's two things. And one thing is when we practice and we take the practice very, very seriously and work very, very hard at it. And they, they think you should go and just really hammer, hammer, hammer at it and keep going. And uh, then if they leave, uh, <laughs> you know, when they come back, uh, not sure if that would have been true for them, okay? What they need to understand is that one of the um, one of the hindrances that's very dangerous is an overexertion or over meditation, and they don't talk. Nobody talks about this. But if you go to one twenty eight, go to one twenty eight and look at the eleven different hindrances. One of them is called um, I think it's overexertion on forms. Too much exertion on forms. And when we see that, we realize immediately what that is. And Bonte had a way of handling this when we were working really hard, six or seven of us were working very hard, okay? Um, he would all of a sudden say, okay, you're just too stale. And I can feel where you're stuck. You're just too stale. There's been too much, take a complete day off. He shocked us and said, go down the mountain and go swimming in the river, play today. And everybody was like, play? What are you talking about? Play, you know? And he, no, stop meditating and go down and put your feet in the stream and swim and let go. It's the excess of energy is one of these. And the other one is, wait a minute, excessive meditation on forms. And the excessive meditation on forms is in a section 26 of Sutta number 128, okay? And that, that tells you. Now, when you had excessive meditation upon forms, concentration fell away. It means the concentration wouldn't work anymore. When my concentration fell away, the light and the vision of forms disappeared, okay? And so what happened is the person gets stale and there's no more progress. Okay, so the solution to the thing is, hey, take a break, okay? That's the thing that we'd like to hear people say more often sometimes if they're pushing really hard. Because when you come back, what happened to that student could happen for you, where you finally let go. And then when you come back, actually what the letting go was about you relaxed more in mind and body. And when you came back and then started to practice, you actually, instead of starting here where you let off, you started down here almost very quickly. How did it happen? And what happened was the person let go. You see, there was too much, I have to do this, too much atta and too much pushing. And by get, get letting up, then they can go through, see? But what I wanted to say it to you is like with the hypnotism piece, okay, they, it, can be, it can be good that kind of guidance, especially if a person has no one to support them, no group to support them, no parents that are sympathetic with what they're trying to figure out or something like that. And they give them a, a guidance 
it's a tool for them to get started. And I don't think it's bad. I, where, where the lecture was saying it is bad is when you choose that as your entire path, just like going to a Godhead and deciding the Godhead's gonna take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. You're thinking I have this crutch, see as a tool, I think it's great. As long as you were that clarity because huh? um, it, it, it sounded interesting and the feedback sounded interesting. The way the post I read was referenced was I've spent my life exploring yoga. This is the, the, the person who is the hypnotist. I have spent my life exploring personal development. I've done lots of yoga. I've been meditating and now I have found the, the real deal and it's with hypnotism. And so that's why I wanted to so not framing everything else within hypnotism is the way. So I, I wanted to understand. I, think, I can see where people would write that way today. Yeah. But one of the big questions is when she was studying before, what were the teachers telling her and which way were they being sending the person and how much were they um, pushing or, or whatever was going on without knowing what they were saying actually the statement isn't complete we can't really say what it really meant for her she feels like this is it okay but you know like i had a really good student in kuala lumpur once and no matter how hard i tried i couldn't work with the person because in the end i went back a year later and found out that she became a christian and left buddhism and this was from a buddhist family all her life and why did she do that but when I saw her and I saw how happy she was, she was really in testimony. And I knew that she needed at that point in her life to be a Christian and to have this type of thing of the, of the help from, uh, the, the, um, from the Trinity. She needed the help, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. She needed that, you see? Um, for her, the search, I'm not sure what it was totally about, but when she did that, I knew right away. And I told her, it's the best thing you've ever done. I told her that because this wasn't for her because in this life, uh, that wasn't what she was hunting for. The personal accomplishment, it was needing to have that other person. And part of it I know was from family history. I know a little bit about what happened with the uh, no relationship, not li very little relationship with the parents as one working professionally to succeed as a woman and the other uh, was working, uh, you know, um, not the, uh, in the structure, the cultural structure, the female children don't get really close to the father and they don't get the relationship they wanted to have. So there was some, there were some things missing there. And this was like, yeah, this is for me. And it fit, you know, it's like the crystal slipper. It didn't fit, it didn't fit, it fitted, <laughs> you know, and you could see it all over the person. You could see it. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is like in an article like that, I, there's a lot more information I would want to know before I would say something like that, you know, be, but this is a personal experience and certainly for her, it's true. Yeah. And if she found it through that, that's good. Now, maybe over the years, um, you'll, she'll, she'll understand what I'm saying about long term. Is this something you can maintain independently without hypnotism, as long as she's not relying on it as the way, and that has to be there. Hypnotism is a tool. It's a tool to help you to uh, go through places you don't dare look at yourself in a safe environment. And by revealing them, you are learning like what we do in long-term forgiveness training by uncovering what we need to uncover. You see, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Really helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. I hope I helped you there. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. thank you. <laughs> Niranjan, did you have a question? Yeah. Yes, sister. I'm sorry. I lost my connection. That's but, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my question is uh, actually regarding the uh, six hour practice. Now, yeah. I, I, I believe, no, I already spoke with David uh, a lot of times regarding this, but to be honest, I, I don't think I'm actually getting it. So 
uh, the the six hour practice when i'm doing it uh, uh, say for example i'm i'm doing something i'm working on something and whenever there is a distraction arises say for example i'm distracted from the work is that considered an unwholesome state or is it the tightness in the head that is actually considered uh, you know unwholesome you know because sometimes you know i can have distraction i uh, you know without no feeling the tightness in my head so so uh, should i do the six hours for that or or, or how should i proceed i'm, I'm going to sort of um I'm going to sort of massage your six hours for a minute and have you try something. And then I need you to come back and maybe next week tell me how it went, okay? But I'm gonna show you something that I've been working on. And, and this is like whenever anything pulls your mind away at all um, that you can do, you can do this. Um, and what you, you, it's like a game. I, I just finished writing a book about it. We're getting ready to print it in a couple months. We're doing artwork on it now. But the game is called Never Mind. Never mind. And so you're working on something, you know, and you're working at your desk, you know, and you're sitting here like this and you're working. And then something happens over here, or some thought or something starts to pull your your mind away from your work. Okay, and so the first thing I want you to do is I want you inside to say, hey, never mind, never mind it and come back here. And I want you to think about when you're at work, you're living in the present time. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so where, when you have your day like this is your birth and this is your death and this is where you are and you live, you, you live here and when you work here, you um you're in a little car like this and um this is where you live okay and you have a little trunk right here okay and you're in here like this okay and you're you're driving okay and this is your present time this is where you live each day so when you go to work that's where you want to stay you don't want to pull anything in with you from the past from anything that happened in the past. You don't want to worry about anything that hap happens, is might happen in the future. You don't want this to happen either. You don't want that and you don't want that because what we do is a lot of these are already in our trunk. <laughs> these little things that happen, the little things that happened over time, like here or here or here, wherever. Um, we put them in our trunk and we carry them with us because nobody told us we can leave them behind. So here's the deal. When something comes in your mind, don't struggle to um, feel anything about it, okay, or notice the tension coming up. But if something's pulling just very smoothly, you say never mind to it. And that means you recognized it. You recognize that something's out there and this is happening very fast you recognize and so then you let go you relax you smile and come back and it's a very smooth thing and actually this includes all of the steps of the six r's except this the last one which is repeat but you're just going to start doing this all the time in life all the time okay so when something is pulling your attention away you just go never mind like that and you smile and you that's the recognition that something is out there that might pull your concentration away so don't spend any time with examining anything just say never mind let go relax smile come back that's what you do each time. So this is, this is the cycle. This is the way it looks, the cycle, okay? Can you do that for me? And don't yep. make a big thing out of having to, um, don't make a big thing out of having to, to feel, uh, what was it you said? You said, you said that something came up, but it didn't, I didn't really start thinking about, don't even, just let it go and stay in the present time the present time that little box 
is moving like this through life. If you can stay in that little box, you have the happiest life on the face of the earth. <laughs> okay? Because you're letting go of anything that comes in from the past to bother you, and you're letting go of any worries from the future that might press in on you. And so what you do is you're actually alive in this little box. But you're not alive here if you're thinking about the past. You're not alive fully if you're worried about the future. So just stay right there till you're finished your task. Then go to another task. Anything that's going on during the day, when you're talking with people, if something's pulling you here or here, or your mind is jumping around saying, never mind, I want to be here right now. Be here right now in the present time. Can you do that? Yeah? Yes, yes, sister. So uh, the and uh, never mind as uh, that should be like uh, you know, verbally uh, repeated in my head or uh, you can just, I should just play with it you can say it out loud or go <laughs> never mind you're you're playing with your brain your brain is um what where it starts and when you're working with a subject you know you're working on something uh your brain will want to go like that see all over the place and if something's happening you just laugh at yourself your brain you, it's not yourself you're laughing at the brain you're saying never mind let go relax smile come back and that means you come back to what you come back to the task whether you're studying whether you are working at school you're dra drafting your proposal whether you're getting ready to go to a board meeting and you just want to chill then never mind what's around you and relax smile and come back and stay in front of the mirror before you go in to talk to the people to get a raise and you just say I see myself and I'm ready for this talk and I know what's going to happen I'm going to get the raise and you just for a couple minutes in front of the mirror by yourself and then you go in there and you're ready you're ready your frame of mind is you already won you get it yeah this yes, is, yes. This an entrepreneurial thing this is something you master in business and your confidence level and you succeed by staying in the present time and then that's where you are working then you have to go to something else now this is your present time now we're going to go over here that's your present time but leave all the past most of the stuff that comes up to bother you is, is something in the past so what do I mean by the past? I don't mean past lifetime. I mean past this morning, you know, whatever happened this morning or at lunch before you went back to work or whatever it was. I mean, that's the past too. See, an hour ago, somebody made you angry. You come back and then you start thinking on that. Ha, never mind, I'm here now. Get it? And you have little signs on your desk. Be here now, be here now, keep smile, 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 smile. <laughs> keep smiling. Yeah, at what you're doing and your brain will open up better and you'll get sharper and clearer when you're drafting, when you're drawing, it'll come into a more uh, balanced drawing. It will, this is really true, you know? So you, you play with this for a week and I'm not really cheating. What happened was six hours, do not translate into other languages. Six R's is basically for R words in the English language. So I sort of made this little game at first for kids. And then I found out older people can do it and they love it, you know, very older people. So why not everybody try to just, never mind, <laughs> you know? The, the, the ties, every language we looked at, it has a phrase let it go you know let it be i think you guys here you say let it be and you go on don't you, you say, let it be so you have a phrase in marathi or you have a phrase in hindi for that um, the the uh, french is say la vie yeah the thai says um, my pay my pay lie my pay lie and that means let it go we're going to go here we're working here, so whatever happened this morning, let it go and just relax and come back and smile. No tension, don't make a big deal of it. Keep smiling. If you have tension come up, you start laughing at that. Never mind this tension, I'm going to be here doing what I'm doing now. Okay? Okay. Good job. Yes.
It's a good question. It is good. Okay. Yeah, good. Car analogy, you said, you know, where I see in the car, which is the present moment, and the past and the present are in the uh, back and front of me. Yeah. That, yeah. That'll be it. That's it. Simple. Keep it simple and keep smiling. Okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, are you done? Yeah. Okay, next time, uh, this next week, there will be, we will go to the next group of topics and it'll be posted uh, probably sooner. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, you can also send them to me. Uh, it's Kanti Kema 2, Kanti Kema number two, uh, at gmail.com you can send your questions there okay okay so we're going to close now okay wait a sec get upset if i don't ring the little bell but it has stuff inside <laughs> okay May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, Share this spirit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.